Okay. Now, what is this? What is this here? Bill? Yeah, just a straight up break out of the, of the, uh, <coughs> the deltas. Between. The deltas, that's exactly right. What was the percent difference between T1 and T2, right, in the study? And then what do we have here? The effect sizes, which I wish I could tell you I understood better. Than I the effect size, you wish you could tell me. Well, I don't know. I, I guess if, if I didn't know, I would say that the effect size is some sort of measurement or statement of the size of the effect, right? So, <laughs> right? So that would seem to be a useful thing, right? And uh, it, it, we notice that it's sort of in decimal. So most of the time when we see something like that, we think that the minimum value is going to be zero and the maximum value is probably going to be 1.0, right? It looks like it's some sort of ratio, right? Some sort of derived unitless value right? The effect size. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Okay. So now we have a clear idea of what this table is telling us. Okay. And so why don't you tell it, tell us what it's telling us. Okay. Um, well, let's see if we, if we start kind of way over on the right at the effect size and look at the big numbers and see what, you know, kind of work our way back to big effect from big effect to small, you can see the 0.9 uh, would be the uh, leg press 1RM uh, changed by a great deal, uh, followed by the squat 1RM changing, I can't see if that's a 6 or an 8, but... Uh, 0 0.6. Six, okay, uh, significantly less, but in the back of our head it has to be, well then, how did the performance... Well, okay, never mind. Uh, what about the control groups? What can you tell us about the control groups? Uh, apparently no, no significant changes. If you look at the, uh, the percentage differences are pretty, pretty minor, although. Right, because these people for the entire length of the intervention sat in their dorm room and ate Cheetos and surfed porn. Right. They didn't train, right? So, so there was no training effect, right? Okay, so good. And you know what's kind of interesting about what you just did there? is you instinctively, without having read the paper and without being an academic type, right? You just kind of said, well, I kind of like the idea of this effect size thing, right? The size of the effect. Why does, you know, my eye is just going to naturally go there, right? Because when I look at all this stuff, I just see a mess of numbers. Here, I see something that tells, so these two columns are really the most interesting, aren't they? This is just the raw data, which is of interest, but here they're telling us how big the effect was, and your eye immediately goes to these things right here. So that's good, actually, right? And what about the isometric? What can you say about the, the isometric strength outcome here? Well, the, the, the overall, uh, effect appears to be significantly less, uh, but to the degree that there was a bigger effect, it came from the squat group. Yeah, uh, but it wasn't much. It wasn't much of an effect. Okay, thank you, Bill. Excellent job. Um, so yeah, what this data seems to be telling us is uh, that there was little change in the one rep max for the squat control or LP control. Right, there was no effect based on the effect size there was a 25% increase in squat strength for the squat group and a 27.6% increase in strength for the leg press group with pretty good effect sizes there. And there wasn't much of an effect for either group, for any of the groups, with the isometric force testing, right? Now, what is this effect size thing? What is this effect size thing that we're, that we're talking about? The effect size, we'll talk about it a little, in a little bit more uh, detail in a minute. The effect size is just that. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of a, there's actually a whole bunch of different effect size statistics. The authors use what's called the Cohen D statistic, right? And the, and the range of interpretations that they like to use is zero, no effect, 0 0.2, small effect, 0 0.3, moderate effect, and 0 0.5 and above is an effect, a, a, a fairly robust effect, right? And that makes sense in light of what we're seeing here in the data. 
So again, Bill, excellent job with that table. In line with the fact that the control group is a lot lighter than the squat group or the leg press group, the squat and leg press initial measurements, preliminary measurements, were significantly higher, significantly higher than the control group. The training group started out stronger than the control group. Does anybody think that's problematic? Yeah, yeah I think it's a little problematic. Solene, stand up. <clears throat> also, since they didn't have the squat group leg press and the leg press group squat as a, a test, you don't have that. Uh, they kind of they kind of didn't do a crossover thing, but I'm not sure that that's quite as problematic, right? So what all, what they're trying to show, I think, with this table to get a little bit deeper into it without having read the methods or the discussion yet, what I think they're trying to show us is that the squat group guys got their squat stronger by training. The leg press guys got their leg press stronger by training. We really frickin' trained these guys, right? And we made them stronger in the exercise that we chose to look at. I think that's what they're trying to show us here, right? So we really trained these guys and they got stronger in the movement that they trained. CJ, stand up. I think one thing that would have helped, and it, it keeps coming up again and again, and maybe we'll bring it up later, is the fact that in that first uh, baseline characteristics, there's no there's no demonstration of statistical significance of difference between groups. They don't they don't outline. I mean, not only did they not outline the randomization procedures uh, very well, but they don't outline the the based on the population sample that they had how big those differences really are. Right. Yeah. So they're not they're not they're not satisfying us that the population that they chose for study was truly homogeneous and they're not, they're not reassuring us that there wasn't a lot of variance in the, the study sample. In fact, we can just use our own eyes and look at the study sample and see that there was significant variance in the sample. Right? There's always going to be some variance, but it doesn't look like the authors were really, really aggressive about minimizing that variance in, this, in the sample population. They gave us that data in the previous table, right? but we can't use it as is because they give us a single variance measurement, but we know that this is a bimodal. I mean, we have men right. and women, so we can't just feed it into a you know, test for differences because we don't know what those two we, Exactly. Are. We don't know what the standard deeds are. We don't know anything that we need to calculate for ourselves. How, homogene how homogeneous or heterogeneous that population was. So excellent. Let's move on. It's been acceptable from a methodology perspective for them to, to make the, the sex breakdown equal in the groups, or is that also an inappropriate way to do it? Could they, could they say, we're going to make it exactly equal, or does that have its own problems from a random? I think that might have its own problems. I think I would have been more satisfied to just simply see, look at a male group and look at a female group, yeah. right? Because anytime you have a mixed male and female group, you're going to have some variance in the population. It does not disqualify the results of what the authors are saying. It just adds an unwelcome level of variance that makes it a little bit more difficult to interpret the results, especially given some of the other variances and differences that we see in, this, in the sample population. Okay, next. Table three, squat and counter movement jump performance. So this is what they're looking at, right? They're looking at the ability of these two exercises to affect these measures that they have chosen for speed strength performance. The squat jump, the counter movement jump, and we'll get to the drop jump, okay? Who would like to help us with this table? So, uh, we pre-tested all the groups, and then we took them through the, the eight week, and then we did a post-test. Uh, they're showing us the percent difference, and then again, the uh, effect size. And immediately, my eyes are drawn to the squat uh, effect size of 0.6. Uh, so it looks like there was a significant uh, change in the squat jump for the squat group, similar uh, a significant change in the counter movement jump in the squat group, whereas the others did not change to a great degree. <laughs> okay. All right. So, can you sum it up even more succinctly than that? Okay. What does this data seem to be telling us? 
the out of the, the three variables, control, squat, and leg press, the squat was the only one that had a significant impact on both squat jump and counter movement jump. Would anybody say, can anybody say it any better than that? I don't think so, right? Okay. I, I didn't tell you to sit down, though. <laughs> um, all right. So, tell us, when we look at, so you went to the effect sizes and the percent differences. Yeah, Good for you. Right, exactly. So let's go to the part that's hard to read. Okay. All right. Let, let's just look at the percent differences here. What do we see? We see 1.3 plus or minus 6.3, 12.4 plus or minus 8.9, 3.5 plus or minus 7.9. What is it with this freaking plus or minus stuff? It's a huge spread. Okay, what do we call these spreads? Anybody? Confidence, Confidence intervals, right? So they haven't actually told, it, told, told us yet, but I know because I haven't looked at the rest of the paper yet. I'm just looking at the data cold. I think what they're showing me here are the confidence intervals. That's what they're showing me, the confidence intervals, which is usually a 95% confidence interval, right? That is a, a kind of statistic, and it's actually kind of an effect size statistic. What does that tell me? What does this tell me? 12.4 plus or minus 8.9% difference. What does that mean, really? Does it mean that the values that they found ranged from 12.4, let's just say 13 plus 9, 22, to 13 minus 9, which is uh, 4, right? Are they telling me that the actual data that they got ranged from 4 to 22? Is that what they're telling me? No, Diego shakes his head. That's not what they're telling me. Stand, sit down, stand up, Diego. What are they telling me with this data? Well, they're assuming the data has a normal distribution and they're computing two standard deviation bounds above and below the mean. And we know this data is not going to be normal because it's by model by design. They actually, they actually tell us later, later that it is normal. It's it a, sounds like they tell, they right, tell us later on that it's true. normal, right? So that's good. That's a very technical explanation. Can you, can you give us a more of a layman's explanation for what this is telling us? So if you repeat this experiment a million times, 95% of the uh, people will have an improvement on the squat between 4% and whatever. That's sort of incorrect. That's sort of incorrect. That's what with most, same, that's what same, most people think uh, it means. No, I, I disagree. I don't think that's what it means. So, that, so what he just told you is, is what most people would consider to be the correct answer, right? If you talk to a statistician nerd, they'll give you a subtly different answer. So what Diego said was that this confidence interval, thanks Diego, what, what this confidence interval tells you is that if you do this experiment a hundred times, 95% of the time, you'll get that result. No. 95% of the people will. What it actually says is that if you knew the, the truth, the platonic truth about the population, the true mean would lie between these values. We're 95% sure of it, <laughs> right? In other words, if you find a mean of 12.4% for this population, we are 95% sure that the actual, true, cosmic mean, uh, mean in God's mind lies somewhere between these values. And there are two things that affect this. Yes, that's what a statistician will tell you. That's what a statistician told me, right? It means that we are 95% sure that the true mean lies between these values. No, no, no. That number is not the variance of the mean estimator which is what you just said that was. What, what you said is the variance of the estimator for the mean, which is not what that is. What, what, those are, what those are, those are estimates for the two standard deviation bounds. That's what's used to calculate these confidence intervals. So there's, what are the factors that affect the confidence interval? The variance of the population the, and the size of the sample. Those are the two factors that affect it. So my interpret we'll have to work we'll have to argue this because one of us is right and one of us is wrong. But 
But my interpretation of it is it means that we are 95% sure that the true mean or whatever statistic that they're using, the mean, the mode, right, lies between these values. That's what I'm told by my statistics guru. So your statistics guru told you something else, but that's what it means. It doesn't mean that if we repeat the experiment 95 to, uh, uh, a million times, that 95% of the time we'll get that result. It doesn't actually mean that, but that's the practical effect of it, because if we do the experiment a million times, we should, we should get closer and closer to that value. But what you said is right. You look at the ratio. I mean, you got a, 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 a 9 on the right-hand side of that plus minus and a 12.4. So 9 is about, I don't know, 80%, 90%, 85% of 12.4. What you're saying then is that we have an 80% error on either side on our, on our estimate of the mean? Yeah. No. Yeah, it means, no, it, me, it doesn't mean that there's an error. It's not an error bar. Error this is, in right. In our estimate. Right. It, this, is, this is an expression of the variance of the sample and the size of the sample. That's what it is, right? And my interpretation of it means is that we can be 95% sure that the true mean lies between those two values. Right, we'll have to settle that fish later. It's an expression of the variation of the sample and the size of the sample. Would you agree? Yeah, that is definitely true. Would you agree then that it's telling us that if, we, if our sample was larger and the variation within the sample was smaller, that this range would be more narrow? No, the sample could be very large and there could be natural variation. So you could have a plus or minus 8.9% on a sample. But if the it's two things that sample. affect this value, if the two things that affect this value are the size of the sample and the variation within the sample, if I choose a small sample that has a large variation within it, am I going to get a wider range or am I going to get a more narrow range? That's not captured by that statistic. But those are the two factors that affect the statistic. OK, sounds like we're going to argue offline about this. Anything else? So what do you think we gather? What do you think the statistic tells? What can we get from it? What does it tell us? Well, practically. It practically. That since that 12, so the 8.9 tells us that there was a fair bit of variation among the participants in this group. In, in how much improvement they got by doing this exercise. That's what the 8.9 tells us. Right. Some people responded. Both positive some and negative. Some people responded very right. well, some people responded less well. Some, yeah. And the 12.4 <coughs> has to be looked at in context of the 8.9. Right? If it was 12.4, <coughs> but the, it was plus or minus 20, then this data doesn't tell us anything. If it's 12.4 plus or minus 1, then we're really sure that, that if we put people through this training protocol, they're going to improve pretty damn close to 12%. I would agree, I would agree with that. Yeah. But in terms of what the statistic metaphysically means, I think we have a disagreement. So we're going to have to, we're going to, have to talk about that afterwards. Anything else on this? Yeah. So so just, whenever you look at the confidence interval, the fact that if you take the lower bound of the confidence interval for the squat jump, um, the, the improvement on the squat, that confidence interval on the lower bound does not cross zero. Since it doesn't cross zero, then that tells you that you could be 95% sure that there was an actual training effect mm -hmm. there. And that's where you don't see on any of the other measurements, all those lower bounds cross zero. And so right. that's why the effect yeah. size is zero because the researchers cannot say that there's any training effect with that at all because they can't be 95% sure that there was any and that's why the effect size and the confidence intervals are, are so closely related. That's why they're more valuable to us than the p-value, right? Than simply saying, well, it was statistically, there was a statistically significant difference. They're related to each other. They are related to each other, but, but, this, is, but this, is more, this is more valuable to us, in my opinion. Anything else on table three? What does table three tell us then? Anybody want to? Brett, you want to re-summarize what table three tells us? All right. Uh, the squat was the only thing that did anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, a quick question. It seems like most other research papers use the p-value instead of 
this methodology. Is that mm -hmm. accurate? I think that that's that there's sort of a simmering revolution against that. The, uh, the, the, the classical null hypothesis statistical testing model, that's starting to, that's really under attack, right? That's starting to be eroded away. And there's more emphasis on looking at correlations and effect sizes. Mm -hmm. That's in here too, that double whatever symbol is telling them that they look at the p-value for that. Right, yeah, they did, they did look, yeah, he's right. They did look at the statistical significance. It's right here in the legend for the table, right? So they did both. They looked at the statistical significance of the difference between the groups, and they also looked at effect sizes and these confidence intervals. Carl, stand up. Yeah, one thing I've learned, I get, I get lost in the numbers on this table and the previous table. I have to translate them into units. And so, I mean, I like that the squat worked out, and it seems to be the only thing that did anything, but those are centimeters, right? Those are centimeters. So going from 32, that's like a three centimeter increase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and their squat in the previous table, if you translate it into uh, pounds, pounds, which I understand, it's 45 pounds they got on their squat in eight weeks. So there's some problems with methodology, there's some problems with 12% looks really big, but then you, when you hold your fingers out, that's not much. When you look at the, 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 the tonnage the poundage of, of what actually increased in the centimeter, the actual increase in absolute units, you're not as impressed. That's what you're telling us. Yeah, I think that's fair, right? And that, has, that plants questions in our mind about, well, how did they train these guys, right? And could we have done a little bit better? Anything else? Sir? So again, I think you also have to look at the squat jump and the counter movement jump and the reliability of those tests the validity of those tests to be able to act accurately measure the difference. In other words, it, if the squat jump was tested and let's say it increased three centimeters, what's the variance in that test? What's the normal variance in the measurement of that test? What's the inner rate reliability? The the you know what's what the tool that they use is it is it is that tool accurate enough to measure a difference? It's a very interesting question, right? So what he's saying is if we if we have a test where, let's say we have like this um, squat jump test, and the, we have the athlete do a squat jump, and the first time he, he gets two centimeters, and the second time he gets five centimeters. I'm talking about in the pretest, right? The second time he gets five centimeters, and the third time he gets seven centimeters, and the, and the fourth time he gets one centimeter, and the next time, see what I'm saying? He's kind of like all over the place, right? Then that's not a particularly good test for us, right? It's not a particularly good test. So a test that gives us values that are all over the board, right, is not going to be a particularly good outcome measure for us. Who read the paper? Did they address this? Well, if they're using these tests because someone else has already published research to validate that this is a, a valid <laughs> yes, they did, but they also did something else. Do you remember that they published their ICCs for this, for these as well? And we're going to get into that in a minute. So it's a good point that you have anticipated. All right, moving ahead in my Campitelli script here. Next, oh my God, you look at this table and you just kind of go FML, right? Oh. <laughs> So, um, so I'm going to make it easy for you. All right, we're just we're going to go through this real quick. Um, what what this is is the data on the drop jump performance, where they basically stood on a big high box at a certain height, and they took a step off, and then they jumped and they hit the platform and they tried to jump off the platform as hard as they could and as fast as they could, minimizing the contact time, right, and then jumping as high as they could, and it's like a sea of numbers, right? Which is a little bit mind numbing in part for all the reasons that Carl just told us, all right? But we now know that we have a couple of shortcuts. We can go to the most interesting part of the table for this first look at the data. And what's the most interesting part of the table? The effect sizes and the percent differences, right? So that being the case, who would like to tell us what this table says? 
Go ahead, stand up. It looks like the, um, the biggest effect size is for the light press. For which? So there's like, right, you're, for, for, for drop jump 24, the biggest effect size was for the leg press. For the 32 centimeter, the leg press. For the 40 centimeter, the leg press. And for the 48 centimeter, they were equivalent. But they actually report a little bit of a difference in the mean here. But, so the effect sizes were bigger for the leg press. But here's where we're getting into this. Here's where we need to make sure that we're looking a little bit more carefully. So let's look here where we see the biggest effect size for the leg press on the drop jump performance. Right? The effect size was 0.4. But if we look at the percent difference, the squat increased the drop jump performance by 5.2 plus or minus 9 point. This is the performance index. So if we look at this a little bit close, performance index, what's that? That must be some sort of derived unitless value that the researchers used to sort of quantify what's going on with the drop jump. And if we look at that, it changed 5.2 plus or minus 9.2, so it crosses zero, in the squat group. It decreased in the leg press group. And that was a large effect. <laughs> so the large effect that we're seeing there is not a positive effect. It's a negative effect. And again, regardless of what the metaphysical meaning of it is, look at the, look at the spread on that particular value. It's huge, right? So what does it mean? I don't, I don't know. But if I was going to take anything away from this, it's like, well, yeah, if I want to improve, improve my, my drop jump performance, I don't think I want to leg press, right? I think, my, I, I think I'm going to bet on the squat here. Same thing with the 40 centimeter. The control group, yeah, they just, so they're, you know, they got the dwindles. They're wasting away here, right? The leg, the leg press at the 40 centimeter group, they saw a decline in performance. And the same thing with the 48 centimeter group. But the effect sizes for the negative effect there are not that great. Does that all make sense to anybody? Anything else that anybody wants to say? No, it doesn't make sense doesn't at all, right? The, the control group the same. Right, 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 right. But, but, the, table, but the table makes sense, right? We, we can get some, we can interpret it. It just doesn't give us much to go with. But I mean, from, from our perspective, you know, one of the methods we use for somebody who can't squat is you might put them on the leg press until you get them strong enough to squat. That, right? So that, just the fact that we've seen that happen hundreds of times well, makes this a little weird. But what are you trying to say? I think the title of this paper should have had is Strength Training Shows No Improvement in Counter Movement Jump Performance. Right? This they, is they, not the counter movement they, jump. Uh, this is sorry, the this is the drop jump. Right. They could have taken just this data and published. We put people through an eight week protocol, which increased twenty seven percent their leg press strength, and showed. As, assuming assuming that they gave us a reason to believe that the study was adequately powered to reach that conclusion, right? So right, but that and, and we already saw in the abstract, right, where they they said, well, there were some indications that the squat was better. There were indications, but they didn't really report that that was robust, right? So, yeah, I'm glad we kind of took a little bit of a shortcut with this data because this was the least impressive data in the paper. Sir? The, uh, looking at the details of the, the actual numbers, the thing that I find interesting is the, the leg press, their, the height they were jumping didn't change, but they got slower with the training. Like, if you can, yeah, if you can get anything out of this data, right. Whereas but the squat group jumped higher and got faster. Again, if we can believe it, because when we look at the spreads on all of this data and when we look at the effect sizes, I, for one, am not particularly impressed, right? If, so you, can, you, can, you, can you kind of maybe sell it that the squat was a little bit better for the drop jump? There's, it, can you kind of sell it that way? Yeah, sort of. 